right, well, it is 7 o'clock, and I'd like to welcome you to Marshall High School. Before I begin the formal introduction for the program this evening, I'd like to turn it over to our Spanish language interpreter, who will make an announcement in Spanish. Buenas noches a todos. La reunión de hoy a la noche tiene interpretación simultánea al español. Para aquellos que necesiten la interpretación, por favor, nos vienen a ver aquí abajo. Eh, con la mano levantada, el equipo está a su disposición y lo pueden seguir usando después de esta reunión para las conversaciones que siguen. Uh, for everybody, this was an announcement about the availability of interpreting equipment for people who need interpretation into Spanish. If you know somebody here that needs interpretation into Spanish, let them know to come get their receiver. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Welcome to Marshall High School. Please welcome folks into your row. We still have some, some community members joining us, so please be, a, be on the lookout and welcome folks to your row so we have enough spots. And if need be, kind of scooch to the middle so people can join your row. Um, I'd like to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Beth Martinez, and I'm the Chief of Staff and Strategic Planning in Fort Bend, and I'm working in collaboration with our Operations Department, led by the Chief Operations Officer, Oscar Signs, along with our external uh, facilitator that I'll introduce to you in just a little bit. But um, before that, I would like to welcome this evening one of our board members, Addie Helliger, and I'm looking for her because I know she was out front. I'm not sure if she's in the auditorium yet, but Addie is joining us this evening, and um, I'd like you to help me make her feel welcome here and appreciate her for attending this event this evening. Um, before we go much further, Dr. Dupree would like to welcome you, and he has uh, created a short video for you, and so we're going to kick off with that, and then I'll say a few more words about the process, and then turn it over to our presenter this evening, who will walk you through the process, talk about this planning process, and share a, an extensive amount of data so that you'll be equipped to ask questions and have conversations as we move into the second part of this evening. But I'll go into that just a little bit deeper after you hear a message from Dr. Dupree. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's community meeting on Facilities Master Planning. We truly appreciate you taking the time to join us and provide your feedback on how Fort Bend ISD can better utilize our facilities and serve the students of Fort Bend ISD while providing innovative programming and exceptional learning environments throughout the district. Tonight, you will hear more about options that have been developed by the community-based Facilities Steering Committee after a review of preliminary facilities assessment data from each school and an initial review of the overall educational environment at each district facility. As you discuss the various scenarios tonight, it's important that you keep a few things in mind. There are some key factors that you need to take into account as you consider options and give feedback on the options. One of the most important things you need to think about this evening is what the primary goal is. Is our focus on providing programming for our students regardless of cost or is finance the bottom line? So you need to think about is the decision going to be fiscally conservative? For example, would we use every available seat at our high schools to rezone and get all the students balanced throughout our 11 high schools? Or would we consider an option that constructs a new facility at some of our high schools or perhaps a new high school in the district? All citizens would bear the cost of that decision, so we need the entire community to weigh in on what's the best option for the students in Fort Bend ISD. The other thing that's very important tonight as you make your decisions, as you give your feedback, is to really look critically at the process. This is a transparent process that sometimes gets a little dirty, to be honest, because we're airing all kinds of options, many of which may concern members of our community because they worry about their community-based schools. So it's very important that you understand and make sure that you interact with one another in an honest, transparent way with the understanding that the things you are hearing are options, just that, simply options. They're not decisions, they're not recommendations, they're not even proposals, they're ideas. The work you do as a community will further guide the work of the community-based committee as that committee develops ideas and then recommendations and proposals for the administration to take to the board. 
So that's why it's so important that we have as much community engagement in this process as possible. And with that in mind, the last thing I would ask you to make sure you consider as you do your work this evening is to make sure if you have a new idea, a fresh idea that you have not seen discussed anywhere in this presentation, please bring it forward. Share it publicly, put it in your notes, put it in your feedback. We're still looking for ideas and solutions for ways to best utilize our facilities while advancing and growing academic programming for all students in this school district. No idea is a bad idea and all ideas will be given full consideration. And now it's time to get on with the work of the evening. You've got a lot to do. Again, I want to thank you for making time to be with us. In Fort Bend ISD, we believe in operating as a collaborative community and your voice is important. Your ideas are important and we thank you for your partnership and all you do to help support all students in Fort Bend ISD. Thank you. Before we move on, if you could just take a look around and if you see folks standing, if you could move to the center of your row area and folks on the sides, if you could join in here, there's seats up top, there's some down here. Um, there's a few up in, in this area here. So just kind of move towards the middle as you can and, and join along so you can see the screen. As you make your way to your seats and make room for your neighbors, I would like to reiterate uh, one of the critical factors that Dr. Dupree covered, and that is that the information that you're going to be working with this evening, the options, as he said, are just that. They are options. These are not decisions that have been made, and these are not in the recommendation stage to go to the board. And that is uh, a challenging process to do in public, but it's a beautiful process when you have the opportunity to talk through the information with facility steering committee members and with your neighbors and with staff and then generate possibly additional ideas that we might be able to consider in this process as the facility steering committee works to shape recommendations that will go to the board in May. So I really impress upon you to remember that, that these are ideas. You're going to generate some additional ideas this evening that folks in the next two meetings will hear about and we'll be sharing out as well and asking our facility steering committee to uh, contemplate as they work with staff to build the options, uh, change the options into recommendations for the board. So it's very important that, um, that you're open to the process this evening and that these next few moments, as you learn a lot of data and you kind of travel across the district, that you're able to focus in on those important areas for you and for your family and for your students, but that you also are given an opportunity to see a district-wide viewpoint in terms of the options that others have, have come up with. So with that, I'd like to introduce this evening our consultant that we've worked with through facilities planning and um, some boundary planning in the past, and that's Scott Leopold with Cooperative Strategies. And he'll be sharing over the next probably 40 minutes some very detailed information. And then like I referenced earlier, we will convene in the cafeteria where we'll have Q, uh, time for questions and um, input and clarification and ideas sharing and a little bit of collaboration with others in the community and with our staff and steering committee members. So I'd like to turn it over to Scott. Thank you, Beth. Uh, again, my name is Scott Leopold. I'm with a company called Cooperative Strategies. Uh, I personally have been working with Fort Bend ISD since 2013 when we did the original master plan. Um, all I do is facility planning and, and this type of work. I, we also do demographics, but my background is, is purely in community engagement and facility planning. We're not architects, we're not engineers, we don't have any vested interest in any construction or bond program, we're just planners. Uh, I wanna start by quickly kinda of going through the agenda for tonight. I'm gonna to talk briefly about the process and then we're gonna start getting into data. Uh, we have the PASA demographic update. We have some preliminary uh, condition assessment data from PBK Architects. We also have some capacity information. We're also gonna look at the options. Um, all of our options are sorted by feeder pattern and then we have additional idea parking lots and these idea parking lots, again, we're looking for additional ideas because these options aren't finalized. We're still collecting that feedback. And so if you've got an idea that you don't see up here that you'd like us to consider, like the committee to consider, absolutely share that with us. And we'll have uh, all kinds of materials out in the commons after I present for you to be able to do that. And I'm also gonna kind of review the ideas that did come up last night. This is an open and transparent process and so we wanna make sure that we're collecting as much feedback as we can, both on the options that we've developed in the committee and also on the ideas that other community members come up with. 
Um, the, the real goal for tonight is feedback. Uh, so we're gonna have an online survey. It's actually been posted uh, since yesterday. We already have over 700 responses. We've got a great turnout. Um, and again, the, the, the purpose of these options was to get community feedback. We've accomplished that. We're getting a great, great turnout on all this information. And then we'll talk about next steps. Here's our overall planning process. Uh, we started with a project startup, and then we began collecting data. And so the data that we use in facility planning, we're looking at things like enrollment data, condition, data of the condition of the facilities, and capacity. We've taken all that data and we've kind of vetted it through the steering committee and the board of trustees. Then we went through an educational framework process. And what that is, is we, we had some community meetings in February where we talked about some high level ideas. Uh, you know, what do we want high school education to look like? Um, do we want larger schools or small, smaller schools? Do we want to be fiscally responsible? Do we want to focus on program? And then we, we took that information through the facility steering committee, the board of trustees, we looped through the community feedback and took it all the way back. We use that as an envelope to develop options in within the steering committee. The options that we developed within the steering committee then went to the board of trustees. And then here we are uh, today collecting feedback. And this is another loop where we're, we're going through the steering committee, through the board of trustees and then back to then finally develop recommendations to the board. Uh, a little bit more on the steering committee. Uh, you'll see uh, steering committee members tonight, they'll have name tags on like mine. Uh, they were uh, great uh, resources for this process, helping us to develop options. We have a total of 30 members, and not all of them are going to be here tonight. 21 members were designated by trustees, and nine were appointed by the superintendent. The committee members, again, were tasked with providing local insight, creating options, and evaluating community feedback, uh, and then ultimately making recommendations to district leadership. Uh, the committee members have pledged to keep an objective view and consider the needs of all FBISD students. Now I'm going to get into the demographic data. Uh, population and survey analysts out of College Stations, they're, uh, they're demographers that focus um, only on high growth districts in Texas. And so that's their, that's their primary focus. Um, they created an update and earlier this year and presented it to the board. All the projections that we're going to see are based on uh, future housing development and we have uh, projections by attendant zone through the 2018 or 2027-28 school year. Um, and I'm going to go through this a lot in the presentation, but, but please note that when we're talking about current enrollment and enrollment for next school year, that information is going to, uh, to, to reflect students transferring in and out of schools for special programs. And I'll show a good example uh, in, in the coming slides, which is uh, Quail Valley Middle School. It has an uh, a, a artificially small boundary and then the majority of students come in from out of zone for the GT Academy, and so we'll go through that. Uh, as we get into the projected enrollment and the out years, that enrollment does not include any ins and outs for transfers, but is only neighbor, not neighborhood, but attendant zone enrollment. One other map that I'd like to show, uh, this is just the, 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 the parcels for sale that are larger than five acres in Fort Bend. This is just uh, interesting to see because we do have areas of growth, and we may not have land that is available in those areas for additional facilities. Um, I'm gonna go through this. Um, this is, so the blue parcels are what's, what's available for sale. It's in the full report. And um, we'll take questions out front where if we take questions in here, we're never gonna get out of here. And so if you have any questions, please save them till the end and we'll address them when we're out in the commons. Uh, looking at the elementary schools, we're gonna start this is, the, uh, this is the elementary boundaries for every uh, elementary school in FBISD. We do have school board policy that dictates utilization. And what utilization is, is it's the enrollment of a facility versus the permanent capacity of a facility. And that's a percentage. And so if a facility is, is underutilized, uh, under 80%, which is our policy guideline, it's gonna be denoted by a shade of blue. If it's between 80 and 120%, which is considered well utilized per policy, it's gonna be in green. And if it's overutilized, it's gonna be in shades of pink. Uh, we also show um, how many portable classrooms we may have, or portable buildings we may have on each site, just for reference. So this is current utilization uh, this school year. Sure. So 59 comes right through here. Here's six. Okay, and so here's f the five year projection. And so you can see, as we have growth in the air, we have, area, we have schools that are, that are turning from green to, to pinks and reds. And again, this is based on permanent capacity, does not include any capacity from portables, but the portables are on there for reference. 
And here's utilization in 27-28, the tenure utilization. Moving on to middle schools, uh, current utilization. And then utilization in 22-23, in five-year utilization. And then 27-28. And so you can see we have uh, Fort, uh, Fort Settlement Middle School, Baines Middle School becoming overutilized. Uh, other middle schools are, are well utilized, and we do have some middle schools that are underutilized. Again, uh, remember that as we're looking at those out years enrollment, we show a very low utilization at Quail Valley. And again, that utilization is based only on the students that reside in that zone and would not include any transfers. Looking at high schools, um, most of the high schools on the, you know, kind of the central and the western portion of the district are, are well utilized. Uh, we have, uh, you know, starting to get into that 105 to 120 percent utilization at Ridge Point and then some underutilization at Marshall and Willow Ridge. Uh, moving forward to 22-23, again, we, we maintain uh, utilization within parameters here on the western portion of the district, and then we continue to have overutilization at Ridge Point and underutilization at Marshall, Willow Ridge, and Hightower. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, we're not going to take any questions. This is not a rezoning process. This is just a facility planning, and I'll get into that here in a minute. Any, any rezoning, any rezoning is going to be a dedicated process, and we're not going to have any rezoning changes effective next year. Sure. Sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So moving on to our next piece here, we've got facility condition information. We're talking about the physical, physical condition of each facility. Uh, PBK Architects has completed an assessment of all facilities, and this is broken down into two components. Deficiency and life cycle uh, is, is the evaluation of the facility's physical components, so items like HVAC, so heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, roofing systems, electrical systems, plumbing, site, structural components, et cetera. These are components that you're not necessarily going to see when you go into the facility, but they do have a high cost when they become deficient. The second piece of the assessment is an educational adequacy assessment, and this is an evaluation of how well a facility aligns to the current educational speci or specifications or standards. And so it's, it's really a, an analysis of how well the, the school can deliver the program. All of these deficiencies are prioritized. Uh, we have priorities one through four. Priority one deficiencies are, are things that really must be addressed in years one to two. Priority two are things that should be addressed, but they can kind of wait until that year is three to five. Priority three deficiencies would be nice to address, and those are going to become uh, uh, needed to be addressed in years six to ten. And then we also have kind of those long-term considerations with priority four. One of the terms we're going to be talking about a lot today is the facility condition index. Uh, this is another percentage. This is the cost to address identified deficiencies divided by the replacement cost of a facility. So for this process, we're calculating that FCI based on all of the priority one and two needs and then 50% of those priority three needs. Uh, educational adequacy deficiencies are in a separate index and are not included in the FCI. Um, physical condition and those life cycle needs are going to be the primary driver for facilities actions. We're not going to use educational adequacy as a driver, but it will be a consideration once a facility is determined needing, it is determined that a facility needs capital investment. Uh, one last thing we have here, we have the 66% or the two-thirds guideline, and, and what that is is if, is if we have a facility that's in poor condition and the repair costs exceed 50, 66% of the replacement costs, it's often more cost-effective to replace the facility rather than renovate it. Okay, moving on to capacity. All the capacity information that we're showing in those maps that we had earlier, that's all based on permanent capacity, and it does not include any capacity from temporary buildings. All of our capacity calculations are based on TEA standards, and temporary buildings or portable buildings, along, the number of those buildings by site, along with capacity, can be found on any of the data sheets that we have. Uh, utilization, again, this is the number of students that are attending or are projected to attend a facility divided by the permanent capacity of a facility. And just as a reminder, Policy FC Local defines that a facility is well utilized when the utilization is between that 80% and 120%. And also to consider that programs are portable and they can be moved uh, to fill excess capacity in, in some schools. Now, putting it all together, this is a lot of data um, it, and it's, it's difficult to kind of quantify sometimes. The following slides are going to show a time lapse of all the facilities 
with their associated FCI and utilization information over the next 10 years. And so this is, this is what's going to happen to our facilities if no action is taken and the demographics shift and the facilities continue to age. So I don't, I don't expect you to be able to read these charts. This is, really, this is really a visual, and I'll point out some schools as we go through this. But we have kind of our, our decision thresholds here on this chart. And so if we look at the x-axis or look horizontally, that's the utilization of a facility. And so if a facility is over 120% utilized, it's going to be in this box over here or these boxes up here. If it's under 80% utilized, it's going to be in this area here. The y-axis or the vertical axis is going to be the condition of the facilities. So the facilities that are newer and in better condition are going to be lower on the chart. And as they age, they're going to be higher. And so this is the, this is the, uh, the current state, the 2017-18 school year. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast forward through time over the next 10 years to show how these facilities will age and how they may, uh, the, the, the enrollment may distribute horizontally. So here's 1819, and so this still includes transfers from special programs. This is 1920. This does not include, we're just on uh, attendance zone students at this point. 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, 2020, or 24, 25, 25, 26, 26, 27, 27, 28. And so you can see, you know, as facilities age, they kind of move up on this list. And as the demographics shift, we have some schools that maybe, you know, kind of on that threshold of being overutilized now that do shift way to the right of being overutilized. And then we have other schools that may shift the other direction. Um, just, just some kind of outliers to point out here. Uh, Meadows Elementary, Lakeview, Sugar Mill, Ridgemont. Uh, we've got some facilities in here that are kind of on that threshold of need, needing some major work or perhaps replacement. And then we have some facilities that are overutilized over here that are in better condition but still overutilized. The goal of, of any facility master planning process is to, is to kind of get everything into this green box where we have our facilities are, are all well utilized and they're in good condition. And so that's kind of the overall goal of this process, to, to address facility issues, to lower the FCI of these facilities, and then look at some other programmatic changes like boundary changes or perhaps new facilities to uh, get the utilization uh, into that green box as well. I'm going to go through this one more time because I, I just think it's a very good way to illustrate this data and, and why we're here. So here's the current school year, 17-18. 18, 19, 19, 20, 20, 21, 21, 22, 22, 23, 23, 24, 24, 25, 25, 26, 26, 27, and 27, 28. Uh, as we kind of went through this and plotted these on there, this is kind of our, our guidelines for you know, what, we would, what we would start with as an option for a facility. And so if we have a facility that is in good condition, but it may be overutilized. Uh, what we would look at is general maintenance to address the condition issues, possibly looking at an addition, rezoning students out, or moving a program out to, to reduce the enrollment and get that, that school into that kind of green area. On the other end of the spectrum, if we have a facility that is in uh, good condition but underutilized, we look at, again, general maintenance in that facility to maintain it and keep it in that, 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 uh, that good condition threshold. And then we could look at rezoning students in or perhaps moving a program in to uh, move that school this way into that green area. Looking at condition, if we have a facility that is you know, in, in poor condition, we could look at a, a major renovation or replacement to bring that facility down into that green box. And so we, we have kind of programmatic issues or bringing, new school or bringing new schools online to address issues as utilization. And then we have renovation and replacement projects to address issues related to condition. OK, now I'm going to move on to the options. Um, I want to start out with uh, no decisions have been made. Um, this is a preliminary set of options. Uh, these options were presented to the Board of Trustees last week. These options are intended to generate conversation and feedback. Um, these options may or may not be acceptable to the community, and we know that. We're here to have that conversation so that the committee can make recommendations to the school board that are hopefully viable to the community. Uh, the community is not limited to the actual options that I'm going to go to but they may also consider other feedback and ideas. So those parking lot concepts, and I'm going to talk about those as well. This is a completely open and transparent process, and so we're going to be sharing things tonight that we heard from the community members last night. 
And so I just want to be very clear that we're, we're trying to collect more feedback, and it's, it's great to see so many people here. Uh, again, since the board presentation, we've already had some additional ideas that we're going to go through, and these are those parking lot ideas. And again, these are going to be updated throughout the process over the next couple weeks, and so we want to collect feedback on these as well. Uh, this is actually a picture from, uh, that's posted out there. This is all the, the parking lot idea feedback that we got last night. I've kind of gone through this, grouped similar items together, and we'll talk about those ideas tonight in the parking lot as well. But this is what that feedback looks like. We're, we're, we're open for business to collect this feedback. Just some considerations before I go into the options. Um, as you evaluate these options, uh, just keep the following in mind. What's the goal? Do we want a budget to provide programming for students regardless of cost? Or do we want to budget conservatively in order to reduce costs and save money? Uh, consolidation. Um, you're going to see some options that consolidate or repurpose buildings. This does not mean that a school is going to be closed and boarded up immediately. Um, if facilities are vacated, they will likely be used as swing space for students while other buildings are being renovated or replaced. In a fast-growing district like Fort Bend, this could be going on for a long time. And also keep in mind that demographics do shift over time and vacated facilities can also be opened again. Consolidation is, is intended to give students access to more resources by having you know, a larger student population in a school. All of our options are grouped by high school feeder pattern, and the reason that we do this is because we show costing information by option. And so we can't have uh, a school that, that, that is physically located in one feeder pattern that has a boundary that goes in another feeder pattern in both feeder patterns because it would throw our costs off. And so I'll go through some, some specific examples uh, where we have a school that is physically in one feeder pattern that serves a lot of students in another feeder pattern. But just keep in mind, I'm just going to specifically call it out. Uh, First Colony and Fort Settlement are both physically located in the Clements feeder pattern, and so that's where those options are going to be. But they do have a lot of students in Elkins, and so you may be looking at the Elkins feeder pattern and wonder where the middle schools are uh, that you may attend. Uh, they can be found in, in, the, uh, in the Clements feeder pattern. Sure. Uh, what a feeder pattern is, is it's the progression of schools that a student would go through. And so a 100% clean feeder pattern would, would be when we have one elementary school feeding into one middle school, and then that one middle school feeding into one high school. I'm going to start with Austin here, because I think this is a good illustration of this. And so this is our option sheet, and this just shows kind of our background information. And so this map shows our existing Austin attendance boundary in purple. And so this is the existing Austin attendance boundary. The middle schools are shown in the orange outline. And so this is the Satarsha boundary down here. And then this is the Garcia boundary over here. And then we have the elementary boundary shown in the shades of color. And so we've actually put every school on this map that may touch the, the Austin attendance boundary. So you can see that the only schools that we have physically located in the Austin feeder pattern are Oyster Creek and Walker Station. But we do have portions of Lakeview, Arizona Fleming, Holly, and Madden that all have students that, that go to those schools which are outside the feeder pattern, but will end up at Austin for high school. And so this is just kind of how we or we've organized this. Um, just some issues that we have in this particular area in Austin. We have overutilization in schools in adjacent feeder patterns. And so once we get to the Travis uh, options, you'll see that we have some major overutilization at Madden. We have some underutilization in the, in the adjacent feeder patterns as well. We have some underutilization at Bush. We've got uh, relatively low enrollment at Holly. Uh, Lakeview has a feeder pattern split. And when we're talking about a feeder pattern split, that occurs when we have students from an elementary school feeding into more than one middle school. And so Lakeview, in this case, splits between Sugar Mill and Garcia. And so at, at sixth grade, about 310 students, so the majority of the students from Lakeview, would split off and feed into Garcia, and then they would go to Austin, and then the other portion would go to Sugar Mill Middle School, and then on to um, Kempner. Uh, a school that has a 100% clean feeder in this case would be Walker Station. All the Walker Station students would go to Satarsha for middle school and then on to Austin for high school. That's a 100% feeder. When we look at, I'm going to spend some time on this sheet just to go through all this data, and you'll see all this data sheet, uh, all these data sheets out in the commons, and this is all posted online as well. 
Here's all the information that we're looking at. We have school name, school type, what the year built was, square footage of the facility, and that's permanent square footage and does not include any portable space. Deficiency cost, so how much does it cost to uh, address those priority ones, twos, and half of those priority three issues? And then we have our index, which is the deficiency cost divided by the replacement cost of that facility. We also have in here just the educational adequacy index for reference, and then we have our capacity information. And again, this is how many students the facility can hold in its permanent space. And then for reference, we have the number of portable buildings and then the portable capacity as well. Um, this is not a component of this. These are totally separate numbers. Uh, we don't show them added because per policy, we're looking at permanent capacity. But know that if a facility is over 100% utilized, it likely has students and portables to accommodate that over enrollment. Yes, we'll, we will get to Marshall. I'm just starting with Austin. We're, no, I'm sorry. We, we, have to go, we have to go through every single feeder pattern. We have to have, we have, to have the, same, the, the same show every night. I will get to Marshall, I, I promise. Okay, I'm going to continue to go through this. So this is our current enrollment. This is our five-year projected enrollment. So this is the data that we're using for planning. Then we have our enrollment change. Again, the current enrollment does not include or includes our transfers in and out. For programs, the projected enrollment does not but we have this net transfers in and out for, for reference. We then have our utilization. This is the number of, this is the, this is the enrollment versus the capacity for the current school year, and then a five-year projection. And so in this school, you can see we have Oyster Creek projected to go from 90% utilized to 78% utilized. Garcia is projected to go from 72 to 81. Satarsha from 79 to 85. And Austin is projected to stay stable at 92%. Looking at our options for Austin, uh, the, first op the first option is Construct Elementary 51. This will provide relief for Madden and Neal Elementary schools. Uh, other considerations are to consider rezoning uh, with some of the schools in the adjacent feeder patterns. Some other uh, some ideas that came up, we had consider constructing Elementary 51 with a classroom addition to bring the capacity over 1,000 to address future growth. And then we had some additional ideas from last night. Consider aligning Madden with Elementary with the Austin High School feeder pattern and consider building Elementary 51 large enough to accommodate all of Aliana within Madden. Consider an additional school in the area. And so these are the parking lot ideas that we had last night. If you have additional ideas, we're absolutely looking for that feedback. Moving on to Bush. Schools in this area, Patterson, Seguin, Crockett, Jordan, Mission West, Mission Bend, Mission Glen, Holly. Crockett, Hodges Bend, and Bush High School. Except Patterson and Seguin, all of the elementary schools in this area are projected to be underutilized. Enrollment at Patterson and Seguin is projected to continue to increase. Area middle schools are projected to remain under 80% under utilized. We do have some feeder splits at both Patterson and Holly. So our options in this area are very simple. Just perform life cycle and renovation replacements on all other facilities based on need. Consider rezoning students from overutilized schools to schools in adjacent feeder patterns to balance enrollment. We haven't gotten any parking lot ideas in this area yet. Moving on to Clements, our issues that we have here, uh, we have utilization in Commonwealth, which is projected to remain over 120%. Colony Meadows is projected to remain over 120%. Utilization at Fort Settlement is currently below 120, but it's projected to reach 120. We don't have any land for sale in this area to be able to, to build additional capacity to do this, or to, to fix this. So our first option here is to consider some additions at Austin Parkway, Colony Meadows, Commonwealth, and Settlers Way. That'll help bring our utilization down in this area. Option two, this is kind of an outside of the box idea. The idea here is to consider repurposing the administration annex on Sweetwater, which is right here to serve the schools in that area. It could be a K-1 facility that supports the schools in the area or you know, perhaps something different. Looking, moving on to middle schools here, uh, we have some imbalance and overutilization at Fort Settlement and First Colony is a, is a little underutilized at, 100, or at a 104%. And then this option will put an addition on First Colony and then we'd have to rezone to balance enrollment between First Colony and Fort Settlement. Some other parking lot ideas that we got, consider reuse of a commercial site along six for additional elementary capacity, and also consider moving the gifted and talented program at Quail Valley to another middle school, and then perhaps looking at balancing enrollment between Quail Valley, Fort Settlement, and First Colony with possibly within the Elkins feeder pattern. 
Some other ideas, consider using uh, the University of Houston Fort Bend facility to relieve Clements at Fort Settlement, looking at partnering with charter schools to reduce enrollment, build a new middle school in the Riverstone area, consider the annex as a 4-5 center, also to take another look at capacity and, at Fort Colony Bend and consider an addition, uh, and then consider aligning Telfair back to Kempner to relieve Clements. So Dulles, facility issues here. Meadows Elementary, if you remember our chart before, Meadows is the, was the highest, uh, highest uh, dot on the chart there. It has the highest FCI of all facilities. The remaining elementary schools have utilizations that are between 66 and, and 118 percent. Barrington Place currently splits between Dulles and Kempner. Looking at our options here, the first option is to demolish and rebuild Meadows Elementary on its existing site, right size for the population. We look at performing life cycle replacements on the other facilities. Uh, other considerations, we'd, the Meadows students would have to be accommodated at a, at a nearby school or another site while the existing facility is demolished and rebuilt. Uh, option two, uh, vacate the Meadows Elementary site and accommodate the students in adjacent schools. We could have enough capacity between Barrington Place and Dulles to, to just serve those students in those schools. Some other ideas we had here, consider rebuilding meadows large enough to serve both Barrington Place students within the Dulles feeder pattern. And so we look at, look at building a facility large enough on the meadow site to accommodate all the students in the, in the Dulles portion of Barrington Place. We look at serving this portion, about 200 students within the Kempner feeder pattern in those schools. Some other feedback that we received last night, if meadows is replaced, allow meadows to retain its identity while it, while it is in a swing facility. Something similar is going on with Juan Seguin this year while it's being repaired due to uh, damage from Hurricane Harvey. Uh, if Meadows is replaced, consider swinging into the old Wharton Junior College facility. It may require some kind of leasing or negotiations or something like that. Another option that came up, uh, consider working with the city of Meadows Place on land acquisition around Meadows to allow uh, Meadows to swing on site during new construction. And so those, those are the types of new ideas that we're looking at to get the, you know, as feedback in these, in these options. Moving on to Elkins, uh, utilization at Palmer is projected to be over 120% utilized. Palmer does split between Elkins and Hightower. Uh, continued growth in Riverstone is projected to increase enrollment at Elkins High School, uh, but it's not projected to exceed 120% until 26-27. Uh, again, as I alluded to before, the, the middle schools that serve Elkins south of six are both First Colony and Fort Settlement. And those options are going to be on the Clements feeder pattern. And so if you want to provide feedback on those middle school scenarios related to Riverstone and Sullivan, you're going to have to go to Clements for those middle school options. So looking at our, at our options for this area, uh, um, we'll, we'll address that when we get to the, I'll, I'll make sure that I hit that at the end. I'm just saying that, that the middle schools, for First Colony and Fort Settlement, are in the Clements feeder pattern. And so when, you, when you're out in the commons, look at Clements for the options for those two schools because the boundaries do spread into um, Elkins. The only two middle schools that are physically in Elkins are Quail Valley Middle and Lake Olympia. So you're gonna have to kind of bounce between Clements and Elkins for those areas. Okay, our first option um, is to, con to balance enrollment up, up here with Palmer. Consider rezoning between Lantern Lane and Quail Valley to balance that enrollment. Again, Lantern Lane were at 111%, Quail Valley were at 72%. Consider projected utilization at Austin Parkway and looking at that to balance enrollment with Sullivan. So Sullivan is, uh, is projected to become, you know, it's not gonna hit that 120% threshold, but it's getting there as that growth in Riverstone continues. We may have additions on Settlers Way and Austin Parkway, and again, those are also in the Clements area. They may be able to relieve Sullivan. And we wanna look at preventing a, a, a renovation life cycle replacements at the other facilities. Uh, keep in mind that we do have an addition that was planned for Palmer that wasn't constructed, that'll be in our next option. And we do have a new school on Lake Olympia Parkway in the Fort Bend Toll Road corridor that's an option in the high tower feeder pattern. And so that'll help address our Palmer issue because that's that growth that we have projected along the Fort Bend Toll Road corridor and Lake Olympia Parkway. Another elementary option for this area, consider building an addition onto Palmer. Uh, consider, again, rezoning between Lantern Lane and Quail Valley to balance enrollment. Consider projected utilization at Austin Parkway and Settlers Way to balance that enrollment with Sullivan. So middle school options for this area. And again, this is gonna focus on Quail Valley and um, Lake Olympia. 
Consider expanding the GT program at Quail Valley to draw uh, enrollment away from the other overutilized middle schools, so like, uh, like uh, Fort Settlement or First Colony. And again, this is not talking about rezoning. This is just talking about existing the program as it is now. So we don't have any options here that we have prepared that would rezone, recommend rezoning anybody into Quail Valley. That's where we get into this parking lot ideas. And so here's our, here, here are the parking lot ideas that we had in Elkins. Consider moving gifted and talent and program at Quail Valley to another middle school and rezone uh, to balance enrollment between Fort Settlement, First Colony, and Quail Valley. And so that would be a, a dedicated process. We're not talking about any boundary changes for next year in this, this process. We're purely talking about facilities. And so if, if a boundary process is recommended, it, it would be a dedicated process that could take place next year with changes not being implemented at least until 1920. Uh, consider addressing Lake Olympia Parkway or Fort, Fort Bend Toll Road corridor growth with additions on Palmer and Parks instead of building a new school. Another idea was consider converting Lake Olympia Middle School into an early college high school. Uh, this could be a facility that, that is brand new that could house all of the academy programs or it could be a, 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 a early college program where students would be able to take college courses with, through dual enrollment. We would have to move the GT Academy in order for that to happen because we would need to rezone the Lake Olympia students uh, in some way, shape, or form to Quail Valley. Some other parking lot ideas that we had uh, from last night, uh, partner with charter schools, uh, build a new middle school in the Riverstone area, consider the intersection of LJ Parkway and University or, or Sixth and University. Uh, this is another one, it's time for the district to consider vouchers to give parents options uh, different than overcrowded campuses and underperforming schools. That was something that came out last night. Okay, Hightower. Uh, our, our issues here, uh, utilization at Burton is projected to remain under 80%. Utilization at Parks is project, projected to exceed 120%. Utilization at Hightower is projected to you know, be below 80%. But again, remember that um, this projected number does not include any students in any academies. We do have a couple academy programs at Hightower that currently are about 200 students uh, coming into that school from out of zone. Uh, Hightower does not have a middle school within its boundary. And so it's the only school in the district that does not have a middle school within its zone. It's served uh, exclusively by Lake Olympia, which is in the Elkins zone, and Palmer does split between, uh, Lake, or between Hightower and Elkins. Our option for this area, construct a new elementary school to relieve parks. Uh, and it would be somewhere in that Lake Olympia Parkway, Fort Bend Toll Road corridor where that development is occurring. Uh, and again, this could also provide relief for Palmer and the Elkins feeder pattern. Uh, some other ideas that we had, consider addressing the Lake Olympia, uh, you know, this, this growth area with additions at both Palmer and Parks and instead of a new facility. Can consider converting Lake Olympia Middle School to the early college high school like we mentioned in the previous slides. Okay, Kempner. Lakeview also has one of the highest FCIs in all of Fort Bend ISD. It also has an expansive attendant zone that goes beyond uh, you know, east or west of 1464. And if you recall from our FCI slide, Town West, Sugar Mill both have marginally high FCIs as well. And they do need to require some significant renovations. Our option, first option here is to close and repurpose Sugar Mill for district use. Perform a full modernization at Lakeview. And when I say modernization um, versus renovation, this is a very, this would be a very intensive project and we're throwing new construction dollars at it for this option. We may have some portions of the facility that would need to be maintained for, you know, because of some of that historic presence. But uh, that's why we're saying modernization. We'd also have to have a rezoning process to align Lakeview students residing in the Austin feeder pattern with Austin feeder pattern high school, or uh, Austin feeder pattern schools. So this area here, these students that go to Lakeview are actually going to be closer to Oyster Creek or maybe Elementary 51. And when Elementary 51 comes online, we may, may be able to accommodate these students in the, in the Austin feeder pattern. And so the new, the new Lakeview facility would kind of serve this area right here in Kempner, the Lakeview students that are, that are in Kempner, and the Sugar Mill students. Okay, option two. Um, Close and repurpose Lakeview for district use. Perform major renovations at Sugar Mill. And so this is kind of the flip of the previous option. Consider zoning the Barrington Place students within the Kempner feeder pattern. 
into either Sugar Mill or Town West. And so the idea is, is we'd be able to fix this feeder split between those two schools. And again, we'd also have to look at fixing that area that is um, currently Lakeview that is in the Austin feeder pattern. Some other ideas that we have here, consider building an addition on Town, on town, town West and either renovating Sugar Mill or re rebuilding Lakeview large enough to accommodate the Kempner portion of the Barrington Place students. And so the idea is that between Town West, Sugar Mill, and Lakeview and the Kempner portion, we have about 1,400 students. We could accommodate those schools, those students in those two schools if they're built large enough. Other our feedback that we got is consider aligning again Telfair back to Kempner to relieve Clements. Consider the Lakeview site for an early childhood center. Uh, consider renovating Lakeview and Sugar Mill and keeping both sites open. Uh, so they would be smaller facilities, but we could look at some kind of programmatic option and maybe have a sister school concept there. Now. I want to I want to thank you all for being so patient. But but please please let me get through please let me get through this uninterrupted so that we can get out into the commons and have discussions and collect feedback. So our issues in the Marshall feeder pattern is the overall utilization at the elementary level is below 80% and is projected to continue to decline. So we're currently at 71% at the four elementary schools projected to go down to 63%. Our four elementary schools are Armstrong, Glover, Hunters Glen, and E.A. Jones. Uh, Missouri City Middle School is currently under, under, utilized under 80% or, and is can, you know, projected to stay pretty level. Marshall's at 51% and is projected to increase to 55%, but it's still uh, under that 80% threshold. And those facilities are both in good physical condition. Okay, now, here's our first, here's our option for this feeder pattern. Now, um, we have other options that we're going to talk about that in impact Marshall High School, but we're going to talk, those, talk about those at the end when we talk about overall high school options. And so right now this is just an elementary option. This is to close and repurpose Hunter's Glen for district use. Perform renovation and life cycle replacements. Please let me get through this. P perform, per perform renovation and life cycle replacements on the other facilities based on needs. And so, again, Hunter's Glen could be utilized as a swing space where renovation projects occur at the other schools. Just a consideration for this, between those four schools, Armstrong, Glover, Hunter's Glen, and Jones, we have 1,100 empty seats. And so, again, I'm going to go back to that kind of uh, preamble that Dr. Dupree had. We want to be fiscally conservative and, and budget to save, and reduce costs and save money. Or do we want to provide special programs and those things in, all, in schools regardless of cost? Thank you. Parking lot ideas, we haven't received any yet. And so I'm, I'm guessing that we'll probably get some other ideas tonight. OK, moving on. Ridge Point? No, I'm, l please, no, please, let, let me please get through this. And we'll have discussions out in the Commons afterwards. OK. Okay, the way that the presentation is structured, as you could see, was in alphabetical order by high school feeder pattern for specific options, excuse me, for options related to elementary and middle schools within those feeder patterns. We have a specific area dedicated to high schools, and that's what uh, Scott was explaining, is that we've worked through the elementary and middle schools. He'll be moving to the options as soon as we finish the alphabet for feeder patterns to talk specifically about some high school options. And so certainly know why, why a lot of you are here and concerned, but there's also a lot of folks from across the district here as well as a large uh, group from Marshall. We've purposely scheduled four meetings across the district um, to help logistically for, for folks to either meet close to home or close to work um, or come to all four meetings if need be. So thank you for your patience. I know it's a, a long presentation with a whole lot of data and in many instances, but we have more information about Marshall to share in the high school option. That's why I, I beg for you and your grace 
to, to be patient as we work through these for people who may be here from the ridge point feeder pattern and then allow for that high school discussion where there will be more information about Marshall. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to ridge point. Uh, utilization at Ridge Point High School is projected to exceed 120% utilization. It's currently 108% projected to go to 139. Utilization at Leonetti and Siena Crossing elementaries are projected to exceed 120% utilization. Heritage Rose is also projected to stay below 120% within the five years, but exceed 120 after that. Uh, we still have pr more projected growth in this area beyond the five-year planning horizon. First option in this area, build two new elementary schools, one in the Texas 6 corridor, and then one in, the, one in the Siena Parkway 521 corridor to balance enrollment. And keep in mind, we do have additional growth projected in this area after 22-23. Looking at the, the middle school, high school options, the first option we have is to consider a great configuration change, convert Baines to a 6-7 building, have Thornton be an 8-9 building, and Ridgepoint a 10-12 building. And so that would reduce the overutilization at Ridge Point by, by moving that enrollment down to the middle schools. Our last option uh, in Ridge Point is to construct a ninth grade center for 1,000 students to relieve Ridge Point High School. High school enrollment is projected to reach 4,000 students within the next 10 years. The total capacity at Ridge Point with a ninth grade center would be 3,505. And so it would get us closer to that number, but we'd still need some additional actions to, to totally relieve that overutilization. Parking lot ideas, if building a ninth grade center is not an option, would you rather see a rezoning process to distribute Ridge Point students to the other schools or a programmatic change at Ridge Point like a split shift to accommodate students? And so basically having an AM shift and a PM shift. Uh, other feedback that we got, if the grade configuration change can't be implemented for next year, uh, consider opening Thornton with only seventh and eighth grade to avoid any kind of double move scenario and then fully implement the 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, 12 option in 2019-20. Moving on to Travis, uh, due to current overutilization, uh, first through fifth graders enrolling in Madden are being overflowed to Oyster Creek. Utilization at Madden is projected to be over 200% by the 22-23 school year. Elementary 51 is planned to open in the fall of 2019, but will not have enough capacity to address over, uh, over or the projection uh, between Neal and Madden. And so we do have an adjacent capacity in Bush and Austin, in Oyster Creek and Holly. And so we may have to look, as the boundaries are, are being determined for Elementary 51, uh, balancing the enrollment between those schools. So here's, again, here's our first option. Build a campus addition on Neal. So the core was designed for 1,000 and then rezoned to balance enrollment, knowing that we're going to have relief for Madden coming from the Austin feeder pattern. And so, again, the location for elementary 51 is going to be right here, but that data is going to be in the Austin feeder pattern. Some parking lot ideas that we had in this area. Consider building an addition on Oakland to address overutilization. Consider aligning Madden Elementary with the Austin High School feeder pattern so that we have a clean feeder for Madden to Austin to Garcia, or Madden to Garcia to Austin. Consider building elementary 51 large enough to accommodate all of Aliana uh, within Madden and 51. Consider an additional school in the area beyond 51. Um, other ideas, if Madden is going to Travis, it should, it should feed to Bowie and not Garcia. Also, looking at building a two-story addition on Madden, uh, where the existing portables are, uh, and then also consider rezoning all non-Aliana residents out of Madden. Okay, Willow Ridge. Utilization at three of the four elementary schools is projected to decline below 80%. Blue Ridge, Briargate, and Ridgemont all have FCIs that exceed 50%. And so these facilities are all in need of some, some major renovations. McCall. So again, uh, as I went through earlier, the facility condition index or the FCI, that's the, that's, that's the renovation cost versus the replacement cost. It exceeds 50% at all, you know, at three of those four buildings. And so they're in need of major renovation work. Willow Ridge High School is projected to remain under 80% under utilized. So our first option for Willow Ridge is to have a major renovation at Ridgemont to create a PK through first grade building, focusing on early literacy. We would construct a new 1,200 student station two through five building on the Shadow Creek Ranch website, or the Shadow Creek Ranch site, to accommodate the addition of the other students. 
we would close and repurpose Blue Ridge, Briargate, and Ridgegate. One of the considerations in this option is that all students would be together by grade, uh, pre-K through 12th grade. And so we'd have all, all the first graders and, and uh, kindergarten PK through first graders in the Ridgemont site, and then two through five would all be on a, a, new, a brand new facility on the Shadow Creek Ranch site. Okay, next option for this, this area. We would have major renovations at Briargate, Ridgegate, and Ridgemont to address those condition issues. We would close and repurpose Blue Ridge. All of the elementary facilities in this area, again, are in good, to, you know, fair to poor condition. Uh, we may have some ideas for grade configuration between these schools to maybe do one of those early literacy programs to help programmatically in this area. We haven't received any parking lot ideas yet. Okay, now I'm going to go on to high schools. Please let me get through this. So our issues here, if you look at the overall utilization at our high school facilities, we're, in, we're, we're within FC local parameters, and so we're between that 80 and 120% utilized in most of the high schools in the district. We do have an imbalance between Ridgepoint, Hightower, Marshall, and Willow Ridge. So overall, the district-wide enrollment is projected to increase by 1,256 students and 764 of those students are projected to be at Ridge Point High School. And so again, our issue here is balance. Now, let me, please let me continue. High school option one. So what this is, is this is a comprehensive rezoning process that we would go through. And this would be a dedicated process that would not take place until at the very least next year. This would, this would look at balancing enrollment between Ridge Point, Hightower, Willow Ridge, and Marshall. It would be a, a comprehensive process that would involve all poor, four schools and may even involve Elkins in some way, shape, or form. But the idea in this option is to, you know, we would look at taking area out of Ridge Point into the other schools in some way, shape, or form. In this scenario, we would look at increasing enrollment at Hightower, Willow Ridge, and Marshall. We would need all three facilities in order to accommodate the projected growth in Ridgepoint. So that's that option. Now option two is converting Marshall High School into a dedicated early college school which would replace all current academy programs. Now again, I want to reiterate, I would like to reiterate that these, that these are options and they are intended they are intended to solicit feedback, and we'll be collecting that feedback on our surveys and our wall charts out in the comments. When that would happen, we would have to rezone to balance enrollment because Marshall would no longer have an attendant zone. And so we would look again at a comprehensive rezoning process in this area to then also balance enrollment. Uh, this action alone is not going to be enough to completely relieve Ridgepoint. Now, let me go on to the next option here. This is, the, this is the same option, but instead of Marshall, this would convert Hightower High School to be a dedicated early college high school, which would replace all current academy programs, or could replace all current academy programs, or again, have that kind of dual enrollment uh, program where students could get college credit. We would again have to rezone to balance enrollment, and again, it's not likely enough to re re relieve Ridgepoint completely. In this scenario, we would still look at balancing enrollment between these schools, which would likely result in increasing enrollment at Marshall and Willow Ridge. Some parking lot ideas that we had last night, uh, just to address you know, this imbalance and these issues. Consider virtual or distance learning for students that have interest in academies that don't have transportation access. So that was all we had in this last week. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Beth for a minute before we get into our uh, feedback process here. Okay, thank you. And, um, and the feedback process, y'all, is so important because as you can see, across the district, we have some aging facilities, we have facilities in need of uh, renovation and s some very extreme renovations, we have low enrollment, we have high enrollment, and we need your best thinking around 
some strategies and some ideas and some solutions for how to mitigate these concerns across the district. And so I'm born and raised here, graduated from Fort Bend ISD. I've been here, like many of you, watched it grow and explode in some areas and decrease in population in other areas and change over time in and out. And, and what is so beneficial to this process that will be our second time in the facilities planning process is this community engagement process. And so, you know, I, I know being, being here and being a parent in this district as well as an employee that we are all tied to the heartbeat of our communities and to our schools. And so we hear that passion and we know it. And, and we, we need to know 